I am such a creature of my particular time and place. Uh, perhaps the most obvious, uh, if trivial, example is uh, my funny accent. Uh, but don't worry, to me, you all have funny accents. <laughs> but I mean it in a more profound way. Uh, what I mean is that the way I think about the world, the way I live in the world, is decisively shaped by where I come from, by, by my geographical location, my family upbringing, my education, the friends that I've mixed with, the kind of media I watch. I am very much a citizen of my time and place. And I'm not the only one. This is true of all of us. And this process of citizenization, to invent a word, is so subtle and so deep that it's really difficult for any of us to think objectively about the way we think. We just assume it. We don't really have a clear idea of what is good and true in what I think and what is not so good and true, but I just accept it because I'm a citizen of my time and place. Now, curiously, we're pretty well able to spot the blind spots and mistakes of former generations and different cultures, aren't we? Yeah? So when you think of 18th century slaveholders, you find it easy to see the blind spots they had. Or 11th century Christian crusaders. Actually, crusaders are a really good example of this. We see their mistakes clearly. Consider this. In the blistering heat of July 15th, 1099, 10,000 European crusaders broke through Jerusalem's walls and fought their way up here to one of Islam's most sacred sites and committed one of the great atrocities of Christian history. Thousands barricaded themselves in up here and sought refuge in the mosque. Some even climbed the roof of the mosque to escape. But the crusaders burst through and slaughtered men, women, and children. Some they threw off the high walls to their deaths. The rest they butchered. The carnage apparently filled this great promenade. When the fighting was done, the pilgrims, as they like to call themselves, marched 500 meters that way to the ancient Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where they held a thanksgiving service. The irony is scorching. Near this church a millennium earlier, Jesus of Nazareth had died on a Roman cross, having called his followers to love their enemies. I hardly know what to say. Here is where the Crusades began, the city of Clermont in the heart of France. It's the year 1095, and Pope Urban II is holding a church council. On the final day, he preaches a sermon that changes the course of history. Urban told the crowds that instead of fighting each other at home, they should go to the east to rescue their fellow Christians. They should channel their violence for good. So he issued a decree. Whoever for devotion alone, not to gain honor or money, goes to Jerusalem to liberate the Church of God, can substitute this journey for all penance. This was something new and surprising, salvation for taking up the sword. Preachers like the fiery Peter the Hermit went out across Europe, urging people to take up the cross. More than 100,000 soldiers signed on. They saw themselves as Milites Christi, the Knights of Christ. You see in early medieval texts popularizing Christianity that Christ and his apostles, Christ becomes a knight, the apostles become his war band. So the way in which Christianity accommodates the dominant political and social culture of the warrior class is absolutely central to the way in which 
religious violence becomes an accepted norm. The church might have converted European warrior tribes, but it was also influenced by that warrior culture. And this helps explain how the Crusaders could see their task as a religious one. We're now disturbed at how shaped by medieval warrior culture these Christian Crusaders were, so shaped by that culture that they could gleefully kill women and children. How could they have become such citizens of their time and place? How could they not have seen themselves the way we with such clarity see them? But that's not the most disturbing question. The most disturbing question is, I wonder what our blind spots are. I wonder if people 200 years from now will look back on 21st century American evangelicalism and ask, how could they have been such citizens of their time and place? It's possible. The only alternative is to proudly think that we've evolved to this point of purity. And in case you're wondering uh, where I'm going with all of this, uh, fair, fair wonder, the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Philippians <laughs> begs the Philippians not to be first and foremost citizens of Rome with the values of Rome, but citizens of the gospel. To live by the eternal gospel of Christ's life, teaching, suffering, death, and resurrection for our salvation. Because the gospel isn't time bound. The gospel wasn't culture created. It is God's word for every time and every place. And when we believe it, it saves us and shapes us. The gospel is, if you like, the Christian's truest constitution the thing that shapes our citizenship. Now, this was no easy message in little Philippi. If you were here last week, I pointed out that Philippi was a very special city. Though a small one, about 15,000 people, it had been elevated by the emperor himself to the status of a Roman colony, which made it a little Rome with special benefactions from the emperor, special tax breaks for people living in Philippi, uh, tracts of free land to retiring soldiers if they wanted to live in Philippi. What's more, the Philippians were housed on the superhighway of the ancient world, a 600-mile Roman road connecting the east and the west. It's called the Via Ignatia. So living in Philippi, you thought you were really in touch with everything going on east and west. We're cosmopolitan. So my point is, it was hard for someone raised in Philippi, enamored with the Roman Empire, to hear the message, there's a more glorious citizenship. And I'll admit to you, it's hard for Australians to think that. Because we like live in heaven on earth. And it may be even hard for Americans. Because you're the only real superpower in the world. So, because it's difficult for us to get our heads around this, Paul moves slowly to his challenge. He actually begins in the passage we're about to hear with what seems like just an update about his circumstances. He's in Rome in prison for preaching the gospel. But don't be fooled. He weaves this little update to get to the point that we are to be free from culture, from circumstances, because of the gospel itself. His first theme is gospel freedom. And I'll ask Paige to come and read the first part of our reading together. Philippians chapter one, starting in verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. 
As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of my brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motive or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to, be, to depart and be with Christ, which is, fa- which is better by far, but is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Thank you. This update is unique in Paul's letters. Now, if you read Paul's letters a lot, you'll know that often at the back of the letter, in the last chapter, he'll give like a one or two lines about how things are going for him. This is the only letter where you get like 20 lines at the front of the letter in the first chapter. So this makes a lot of commentators think that something else is going on here than just a simple update. Paul is subtly introducing one of his main themes that the gospel frees us from being captive to our circumstances, to our culture, to our time and place. Now remember, Paul is in terrible circumstances. He's in a Roman prison. He's awaiting trial before crazy Emperor Nero. What we know that he didn't when he wrote this letter is that it wouldn't go so well for him. And the Philippians were really worried for Paul. Living on the Via Ignatia, they were probably the first people outside of Italy to hear that the great apostle is now in a Roman prison. So if you were here last week, you remember, they dispatched a great big parcel of gifts to Paul. One of their leaders, Epaphroditus, spent 14 days, probably with a little crew, taking these gifts from Philippi all the way to Rome. They were worried that Paul's circumstances would hinder the gospel. And that's why Paul says, no, 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 no. Things are going really well. Paul is such a character. What has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Contrary to expectations, Paul's imprisonment has been fantastic. How so? He says, well, the whole palace guard has heard about Jesus Christ. How would that have happened? How would Roman guards ever have heard the gospel without me being here? So obviously Paul hasn't shut up. But he says, so has everyone else. Everyone else has heard that I'm in chains for Christ. He probably means uh, the imperial lawyers, um, the the imperial servants, and, and probably also other prisoners. Paul is free from his circumstances. He trusts that the gospel will go forward. And he also says other preachers in Rome, Rome, where he's imprisoned, have have become even bolder. Um, He he, he says, because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters, probably a reference to the local missionaries in Rome already, but the ones that aren't imprisoned, have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Here's Paul's point. Political, social, physical circumstances do not hinder the gospel. The gospel is a force all of its own. You lock up the chief preacher, boom, the gospel goes. I was invited a few years ago to speak to Christian leaders 
from around mainland China, leaders who were looking after the underground church. And we collected them all together and I was meant to teach them, but I'm sure the Lord sent me there to learn because after my teaching, there would be all these updates about what was going on around the various provinces of China. And one of the women got up weeping and my translators translating into my ear so I could understand what was going on. And she started to tell how her husband had just uh, been given five years in a hard labor camp for preaching the gospel. Things are really difficult for Chinese Christians at the moment. But as she started to speak, it turns out she wasn't weeping for sorrow about her husband. It turns out she was weeping for joy. Because just before coming to this conference, she had heard that her husband in prison had led the two communist officials of the prison to faith in Jesus Christ. And she was praising God for the privilege that her husband went to prison and led these two party officials to the Lord. Boy. Our gospel is free from circumstances. And so, in a sense, are we. We're free. Look at Paul's incredible next lines. It is true that some of those missionaries I just mentioned preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me, for my chains. Um, it may puzzle you to learn that large parts of the first century church despised the apostle Paul. They saw him as a wacko liberal who was letting everyone into the kingdom of God, no matter what uh, race or background they had, anyone could become a Christian by faith in Jesus Christ without also adopting the Jewish customs of circumcision, food laws, and so on. Now, we all take that for granted, but in the first century, they thought Paul was letting the team down. And so, we know that in Rome, in particular, this criticism of Paul was alive and well. How do we know that? Because in Romans chapter 3, a letter Paul wrote to the Romans five years before he wrote to the Philippians, he actually mentions those who were criticizing him in Rome over this very issue. Now, here's the thing. Now, when he writes this letter, he's in Rome, in prison. And those other preachers who don't like Paul are stirring up trouble. Now, please be clear. Paul doesn't think they're heretics exactly. They're still proclaiming that Jesus lived, taught, died, and rose again. It's just that they hate Paul. It's like they're, you know, they're in public preaching and they'll say in the middle of their message, oh, we're not with that agitator that's rightly locked up in prison. We're not with him. That's what's going on. But here's the amazing thing. Did you see it? Paul doesn't care. What does he say? Oh, what does it matter? I would say it really matters. What does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. Man, oh man. Oh, to have this gospel freedom, where you're not worried about what people think of you. To rejoice, regardless of circumstances. And if that feels challenging, don't worry. Paul tightens the screws in the next lines. It gets more challenging. Now, there are so many wonderful things in this next paragraph. Um, there's even a really significant line that gives us a good theology of the afterlife, but I'm gonna resist teaching that today. That's on the cutting room floor this morning. I want us to focus on what seems to me the center of this paragraph, which is basically verse 21. For to me... To live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. 
I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Can you see what Paul is saying? He's saying, if my trial before Emperor Nero goes badly, fantastic, I get to go and be with Jesus. But if it goes well and I'm released, I get to do more good in God's world. Fantastic. It is the great apostolic win-win. Die or live. Now let me make very clear, because this is often confused in a modern Christian context. Paul is not advocating detachment from circumstances. Detachment was what the Buddha taught. The Buddha taught the only way you can find peace is by not being attached to the things that you love. You shouldn't feel passionate for them. You should stand aloof from them. Why? Because if you are attached to things, if you love things too much and they go awry, you're gonna be devastated. So, detach and you'll be fine. That's the heart of Buddhism. This is how Buddha himself put it in his first sermon in what's called the third noble truth. This is the center of Buddhism right here. The noble truth of the end of your suffering is this. It is the complete cessation of that very desire. Giving it up, relinquishing it, liberating oneself from it, and detaching oneself from it. I wanna say this and I say it with no disrespect toward Buddhism. Paul would make a terrible Buddhist. What's more, Jesus would make an awful Buddhist because these people were passionate, attached, full of love. And Christianity is a faith full of passion, full of emotion for the right thing. See, Paul is saying in this section of Philippians, I love the idea of hanging around and doing more good in the world. I love the idea of going to be with Christ. He is attached. So the, the, the point I wanna make here is that Christian contentment is not found in detaching yourself from circumstances. It's found in attaching yourself to the gospel. Because what does the gospel say? The gospel says Jesus himself lived, suffered and died to serve the world and then he was exalted to glory. And if that's true, that's our story too. It makes perfect sense to live, suffer, even die for the sake of others knowing that you will be glorified. The gospel sets us free. And all of that brings us to Paul's main point in this chapter. In fact, I'm gonna show uh, for this week and next, this is the main point of the whole letter to the Philippians. That we are to be gospel citizens now, as Paige comes to read this last paragraph of chapter one, I want you to listen out for something. Listen out for the first command of the epistle. Yeah? Uh, thus far, uh, Paul has prayed, praised, described, updated. He hasn't issued a single command, a single, will you please do this? For the grammar nerds, and I'm sure there's five or six of you, uh, this is the first verb in the imperative mood. The, will you do this? And in Greek, unlike uh, English, imperative mood verbs are actually formed differently from other verbs. So the Philippians heard exactly what he was saying when he said this. Will you listen out to that? Paul, for the first time in the letter, says, will you please, whatever happens, do this one thing. 
Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the, the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Thank you. Did you hear the command? There's a special word in verse 27 that is uh, virtually impossible to translate in English because we don't have an equivalent verb. But it's a very special word in ancient Greek, especially for people living in Philippi. The five words conduct yourselves in a manner, translate the one Greek word, polytueste. Polytueste. This is the verb of the noun citizen. Huh. So you can see the translator's problem, right? Citizenize? Well, it's not a word that we use in modern English. So, so they quite rightly went, ah, oh, what do you do with this word? We all know what it means, but let's translate it, conduct yourselves in a manner. But the reason it's worth knowing this is poly to s there, it's the word that gives us um, politics, polite, polity, police, cosmopolitan. All these words come from this Greek word. And in ancient Greek, in the Roman Empire, you know what it meant? Live as a good Roman citizen. But can you see what Paul is doing? It's very sneaky, it's very cool. Live not as a good Roman citizen. Live as a citizen of the gospel of Christ. Citizenize, worthy of the gospel of Christ. This is provocative stuff in a city like Philippi, a Roman colony where there was no greater honor than being a Roman citizen. This is captured beautifully by one of my favorite New Testament professors in the world. He's Marcus Bockmuel at the University of Oxford. And commenting on Paul's use of this verb in this line, listen to what he says. This is about as cool as nerdy scholars get. Here we go. <laughs> Against the colonial preoccupation with the coveted citizenship of Rome, Paul interposes a counter-citizenship whose capital and seat of power are not earthly but heavenly whose guarantor is not Nero, but Christ. Philippi may be a colony enjoying the personal imperial patronage of Lord Caesar, but the church at Philippi is a personal colony of Christ, the Lord above all. All of that is contained in that opening command. Whatever happens... Polytues, they're worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live as a citizen of Jesus Christ and his gospel. Our life is to be determined not by Rome or 21st century America or Australia, but by the gospel. The gospel is our constitution. Now, I know you've got a very cool constitution. Okay, it weirds Americans out that I have a copy of the American Constitution that I carry with me. It's in my bag this morning. I read it cover to cover. I love it. It is arguably the most important secular polytuess there ever written in history. I'll give you that. But what I'm saying to you, proud Americans, is that you, if you believe in Christ, your truest constitution is the gospel of Jesus Christ, his life, suffering, death, and resurrection. That is our constitution. That's why Paul says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves, citizenize worthy of the gospel of Christ. Striving together, he says, as one for the faith of this gospel. And he means this so much that he says, where to do this, even if it puts us out of sync with America. 
Even if it puts us out of sync with Philippi. Even if it puts us out of sync with Australia. Even if it causes us to suffer. That's what he says, isn't it? Verse 28. Without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. For it has been granted to you. Uh, the word here is the verb of grace. It has been graced to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. It turns out the Philippians themselves are suffering, just like Paul. Roman authorities in Philippi are beginning to pressure the Philippians as Christians. Maybe they're beginning to grow and the Romans are upset by this. Maybe they've even begun to throw people in prison, just as Paul was in prison. But Paul says, receive this suffering with confidence and as a grace. Wow. Now you might be wondering about verse 28. What does Paul mean when he says that if the Philippians accept this suffering without fear as a grace from Jesus Christ, they will be a sign to opponents, a sign that the opponents are going down and Christianity is going up. What does that mean? I think Paul means that when Christians face suffering with grace, and good cheer and confidence, just like Jesus did, that will be a sign to those who don't believe, a sign to persecutors that maybe all this stuff about the crucified and risen Lord is true. See, as Roman officials in Philippi persecute Christians and Christians just love them back, confident in Jesus, receiving suffering as a grace, Maybe the persecutors will go, ah, oh, I wonder if they're right. I wonder if all that stuff about Jesus dying and rising is true because look at how confident they are. I think that's what he means. And you know, there is no doubt in my mind that this was one of the keys to the great explosion of Christianity in the Roman world. It's one of the mysteries of ancient history that, that Christianity took over the Roman world without any power, without any politics, no armies. One of the keys was the way they suffered. And if we had time, and I know we don't, I'd lay out the evidence that we have that people looked on Christian suffering and went, wow, how well they suffer. Maybe their Lord is the true Lord after all. There is also no doubt in my mind that how we Christians suffer in a secularizing America will be a sign to secular America of the gospel, if we suffer with grace, if we bear insult with good cheer, confident of the risen Lord. Because one thing's for sure, if we respond with smugness, insult, punching back as hard as we get it, there's no way we're gonna be convincing secular Americans that even we believe our gospel let alone that the gospel is true. If you trust in Jesus Christ, if his life, teaching, suffering, death and resurrection are your constitution, you entrust yourself to him, you face hardship with good cheer, knowing that regardless of anything, Christ is Lord. And you will be assigned to this nation. Incidentally, we do know that things went pretty well in Philippi in the coming centuries. The archaeology of Philippi suggests that the wider Philippian population got the sign and ended up believing the gospel. Because in Paul's day, the Philippian church was just 20 to 50 people meeting in the home of a woman named Lydia. But within a few hundred years, we know there were three to four massive churches bigger than this room. One of the churches of Philippi in the ancient world was the size of the entire forum of Philippi. Thousands of people could fit in those churches.
the original readers of this epistle got Paul's message. To sit loosely to culture and circumstances and enjoy the freedom of the gospel and to citizenize worthy not of ancient Rome but of the gospel of Jesus Christ bearing witness to him suffering just like him entrusting ourselves to God's grace the Philippians did that the challenge is Let's do that. Let's do that together. And see this country won back to Jesus as we give them a sign that we belong to another kingdom. We live by its values. So Lord, will you please in your mercy Give us ears to hear from your word this morning. Enable us in the power of your spirit to entrust ourselves to the gospel, to live as citizens of Jesus Christ. We ask it in his name. Amen. Thank you, John. We come now to the bread and cup of communion, the Lord's Supper, which is the central symbol of the gospel that shapes us and gives us a new citizenship. You need to know that the bread and cup of communion does not belong to Chapel Street. It belongs to the Lord. So if you're here this morning and you're just visiting even for the first time, if you've put your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, we would love to have you join us in the remembrance of communion. When you came in today, you were handed a small little communion cup. If you turn it over, the bottom side has the the bread. Just peel off that cover and prepare to take it as I lead. The New Testament tells us that on the same night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus met with his disciples for a Passover meal. And during that meal, he took bread, blessed it and broke it, and gave it to them saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this remembrance of him. You can turn the cup over and peel off the other side. After the bread, he also poured a cup. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sin. The apostle Paul reminds us as followers of Jesus that each time we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Do this remembrance of him. If you came prepared to give an offering this morning in person, our generosity boxes are in the back of the room. Thank you so much for your ongoing generosity. And if you'd like to spend a few moments in prayer, either privately or with a member of our prayer team, the glass room in the lobby is set aside for that purpose between services. You're welcome to join them there. Receive now this morning's benediction. May we go now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, standing firm in the faith and walking in a manner worthy of the gospel. Amen. Have a great day.